everyone welcome. It's wonderful to see everyone here. I know this is a little bit of lunchtime, and some of you had to run out, grab some food, or holding off on food um, to see this wonderful session. But uh, I've been really excited for this. So a little bit, this is the Communities of Inquiry Brown Bag Panel. So it started a few years ago when we were honoring um, Dr. Susan Lytle and Susan's legacy. And one of the things that I was thinking about is too often in academia that we kind of like fetishize like the individual genius, right? The, the, the one researcher who's going to kind of come up with all the solutions to all the problems of the world. But if we really step back and think about it, any progress that we do make in education really comes from people working in collectivities, right? In collaboration together, often across institutional, social, cultural, often linguistic boundaries, uh, really thinking together to develop loop educational movements, to develop initiatives for collaborative knowledge generation. And in this session, we really wanted to honor that. So we wanted to have a dedicated space at the forum for communities of Rink inquiry to share their work. Um, so this is this session, and then Joanne Larson and I have been in conversation for a long time. We're kindred spirits of the academy. We both, along with Dr. Yazi, we all believe in really long-term projects based on trust sustained, you know, over years. And this is a project that has, you know, we learned about a project um, that had, you know, a university, community, school, partnership that has really been developing trust and working through struggle on all of the service of educational equity that's been going on for over a decade. So it is wonderful. So let's give a round of applause for all our researchers. <laughs> Freedom School. So, yeah. <laughs> 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 Freedom School is a 
teach at that program. Shop, and we also have the 
Key Slice, which is another restaurant that's graduated in youth workforce development and social capital for our adults and our elders. Our elders are here because they bring value to our community. And together, through a collective, we bring about community-based economic development. How y'all feeling today? Yeah. All right, that's about five of us. There's 50 of us in here. How y'all feeling today? Excellent. Yeah. If you'll follow me just for a moment, could you see this chair? Yes. Did yeah. you see this chair? Yeah. yeah. All right, so when we're dealing with community, right, the two questions come up. Who and what is community? Does that make sense? Yes. Who and what is community? The what is the chair? Did y'all see the chair? Yes. Does that make sense so far? Yes. If it makes sense, let me hear it makes sense. Yes. 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 Okay, this is the what, the who is the elders, the adults, and the children. That's it. If you go to any community, if you're lacking one of the three, it's not a community. If you don't have an elder with an adult set at the feet as a bridge for the child, something's going to be missing. Does that make sense? Yes. If it makes sense, let me hear it makes sense. Yes. Okay, so the what, right, this community, comes or fall on the back end of the who. Who is community? Wherever the who is, the community, or the what is. Does that make sense? That makes sense. I'll do it this way. Wherever we are, community is. Does that make sense? That makes sense. I'll do it again because I like to be clear, not for you, for me, right? Wherever we are, community is. Does that make sense? Yes. Raise your hand if you have parents. Okay, I'll do it again. See, uh, we work in education, so when we raise our hands, when our students raise their hand, they have to be above the shoulder. So raise your hand if you have parents. Hands down. <laughs> raise your hand if you have either children, nephews or nieces, or students, or friends younger than you. Hands down. This chair here, somebody said it before you are now viewing it. Does that make sense? Yes. We have a university. I know at some universities, when you go to, uh, when you're entering as a freshman, one of the things the uh, professor would say is that somebody said these chairs before you. Make sense? Okay, good. That means that there's a history to the seat or the chair that you're in. Yes. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Okay. Because you're in it now, currently, that means that, that has a present and a history that's being built or continued. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Okay. And because you are there, that also means with hope that someone will come, come one day and take your spot. Does that make sense? Yes. So it's of great importance to understand the who of community and the what. The what becomes elders, right? The adults and the children. When they all come together, you now have the what? Community. Does that make sense? Yes. And you understand the who, right? Yes. So if you're doing your work, you're doing your research, and you're in the community, if you don't see one of the three, what does that tell you? Oh, hold on, hold on. I mean, what does that tell you? It's not a community. It's not a community. In order for it to be a community, it has to be a continuum. It has to evolve. It has to have a point of evolution, a cycle. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. Raise your hand. 
and I can see you if y'all raise your hand, you in front of me. Imagine if you came home one day and you walk into your house and everything's changed around. <laughs> and you got who, who moved this? Who moved that? And you go look in there and just these people. We like, um, who are you? They were like, um, yeah, we are doing some research on your house and um <laughs> you want to change a few things around. And uh, yeah. You can have a seat over there or no, move your chair. You can have a seat over there. So we were like, wait a minute, we're not gonna do this adversarial approach to this. Let's um excuse me, can I have a conversation with you? Um, who are you and what exactly are you doing? Exactly. So it's a wonderful metaphor and it's so true. And I think that you know we read these definitions and they sound so simple. But when we talk about equitably involved, it's essential. Hard to establish, but definitely essential. And the idea of unique strength. So it comes from a sense of humility, recognizing we all have strength. We bring these strengths to our work. Every single person in our community. And, um, and then it's like that crossing boundaries, right? And we intentionally, everything we do, what I love about this team, what I've learned from them, is the intentionality of everything that we do. So that model you saw, those little hubs, we work that, we live that. And it's made our work strong. So some of you may be familiar with some of this. I go back to this one all the time. This is Israel's work from 1998. But these are really good principles of community-based participatory research. And I feel like we do. We live these. You know, the space and resources of the community, co-learning, capacity building of all partners. And uh, the last one is most expensive, but the last two, dissemination of findings. We're going to talk about that. You know, whose data is this and how do we get the word out? And long-term processes. Because the idea is sustainability. And I think part of what we learned is it's not programs, it's not research, it's not intervention, it's long-term partnerships. And that's what we've been. We've been a partnership for eight, 10 years now. We've had many projects that have come through this partnership. <coughs> and we're here, we're staying, we're not going anywhere. And our new iteration is really fun on that. Okay. Um, <laughs> and Grace, Grace. Oh, that's it. Okay. So our research evolved from um, the, the determination of the community members. They actually called us. So the so way in the Georgia have a long history, when they purchased the corner store, which was on 1111? 11, 11, 11? Right, 11, 11, 11, they purchased this corner store, and they knew that it was going to change things in the community, because you do have a lot of corner stores in the neighborhood, but they're mostly all my people who don't live in the neighborhood. And mostly Middle Eastern families that kind of um, created a wonderful business around corner stores. But this corner store, when community-based organization need to purchase this corner store of the idea of moving into transactional transformation. It was using, was building a model around this. So they actually called the university and said, come in and help us document, uh, which was amazing. And then it was, we start documenting, we'd stay on the corner, take more field notes with our students, and Rob said, why aren't you working? So we started working, we started stopping. Residents are telling us, here's how you do the line. Well, this, this is how much it is. Or if we didn't come one day, where do you think you were? Exactly. And it, it, our students were part of it too. So running, running the cash register in the market for two years did a lot for us understanding, for us um, gathering really wonderful data, but also for building relationships with the broader community. So. Um, and those are important parts because just as I, I, I made a reference, I can actually see you when you actually come into communities. They see you. You can actually see. People actually see you. And until you actually interact with them, you won't actually know what they actually see. One of the things that we saw was, um, somebody mentioned yesterday, I forget where now, uh, when there are breaches in the working with, oh, it was Lolita, the student, of, of where, where are the breaches of working with? And one was, Joy, when Joyce came in, you know, we had consent forms that they signed. And that was a breach. And so we were able to, and they, and they were thinking of doing this, ask your university, our university now, uh, these guys all took the exam and are now officially study personnel. So they don't sign consent forms, they can consent others. 
So that's something a university will do if you can use ours as an example. Have you hooked the eyes? Work the eyes. And it's going to take work. Yeah. So you're going to be working across differences. Again, I'm giving my perspective, our perspective from the community side, and we've learned the academics have a side. <laughs> but it's, it's okay. You've got to actually have those discussions have to happen. You've got to work across those differences. And that's a commitment. We are committed to, okay, I can be who I am, and you can be who you are. And then let's just be together. Yes. Staying with contention. Okay, we're not always going to have consensus. In many cases, our research team meetings will disagree. We actually agree to work with dissensus. So one of the things that we learned in the process of our, our, our study is different language. When we always talk about consensus, everybody has to agree. Nope, you don't have to agree. You can have dissensus, which is basically you can uh, disagree agreeably. Uh, they would use words we had to work on. What is, they said rhizomatic. Oh, that's a rhizomatic process. What the heck is rhizomatic? Yeah. Yeah. Lucian, the rhizomatic. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> they look it up and go, oh, it's going back grassroots. They just look it up. And we said, oh, you're talking about a grassroots process. Rhizomatic. Okay, we get it. Uh, intentionality, we talked about early. Everything that we do is, there's some things we happen upon, but the results we get, we meant to get there because we have a goal in mind of forward, whatever we're doing moving forward. And the general potential of conflict, don't ever underestimate it, because that's gonna come in building the relationships. We've been talking about years of working together, but there's a generated potential in the conflict. Conflict is not bad. Because the last quote is, Rob said, he says, stagnation is not an option for us. We are not going because the people are real. The children in our community are real. The issues that we're dealing with are real. We can't afford just to be stagnant, to sit and look at research on the shelves. That's not an option for us. And during the time you were saying, if you look at the nose, in the middle of the nose, that's what about that conflict happens, mm -hmm. exactly right? But also when that conflict, that's when the transformation happens, yeah, right? right? So that's a critical point. And I would have to say, too, as a conduit between community and university, the idea was not to let the students come in with the observational journals and just write down what every customer purchases. If you want real relationship building, you put those down, you they'll come and work behind the counter, get to know them in a different type of way, and they'll give you the information that you ask for only when they trust you with the relationship building. So I thought that that was important for the students. And I thank them that the students were actually adapting to that. So I thank both of you for that. So I love you with that process. And we <laughs> sure. It was not easy. Right. Right. And we keep trying, we have our nose, we want to make that thing move somehow or another. We, kept our, we, we struggled with our model making it linear. It's not linear. It's linear. And for those looking to bring, what, why should you switch it? Bring students in, make sure you know the community they're going in first. You're actually responsible for them first. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. You're responsible for them. It'll be unfair for you to bring them in a situation that they're not prepared for. So that's one of the things that we insisted on, because not every student is going to work. And it's okay. This work is not for everyone. So we're going to tell you a little bit about our title, co-researching, co-implementing, co-authoring, and also co-activism. So um, Joanna already told you a little bit about the Freedom Market and the East Freedom Projects. Some of our more current iterations of our partnership is one of them is called Going to Healthy Community. And Ms. Bernice here is part of this project, and she was also part of Engel. So as co-researchers, can you tell a little bit about Going to Healthy Community on project? Our project involved talking to people who live in the community, asking them how they can eat healthy. And being in this community, we found out when we interview people that a lot of people don't eat healthy. Because of uh, poverty, they don't have the money, they, and then on top of that, the food is not there in the community. And you got a lot of corner stores that they go to and eat. You know, that bad stuff. So what we want to do for them is, we want them to come to the freedom market to buy fresh vegetables to know that it is available for them. That they don't, but then again you think about where's the money coming from? 
How are they going to do that? How are they going to buy the food and freedom market when they don't have a limited amount of money? So that's why we are providing this at the freedom market. At some point, we're going to research this and talk to people in the community to see what they need, what can help them, to help so they have healthy, they live healthy, live longer, and they can teach their children how to eat healthy. Because you know, living in a popular community, you know how to take a pen and make a dollar. <laughs> you know how to stretch it. So we want them, you stretch that dollar with the noodles and noodles. Okay, you got oodles and noodles. Why not put some vegetables in the oodles and noodles? Teach them how to live and eat healthy. That's what we're trying to do with the community right now. When we interviewed them, we found out that a lot of the, a lot of the participants, they didn't have that knowledge. Uh, it's not there. So we're trying to bring that back, bring it to them, so that they can grow and live healthy. Ms. Bernice, who did the interviews? I, I did some interviews. <laughs> the team did interviews with people that live in the community. And it was kind of, how can I say it? Kind of sad to hear how people was eating. And because they had to stretch that dollar, and they was eating, I can put it this way, they bought more oodles and noodles than they bought fresh vegetables. Yeah. To stretch that dollar. And it was sad to see that they was like saying that we do it because we don't have the money. The resources is not there in the community. We, and the transportation of getting to the place to get. We have a public market in Rochester, but it's a little ways from where they live. And if you don't have a car, you can't really go get it and bring it back. So this is what the Freedom Market is trying to do. Bring that fresh vegetables and fruit and teach the community how to eat healthy, live healthy, and pass it on to their children. Ms. Bernice, how long have you lived in the neighborhood? Have you lived there? I lived in the neighborhood for 15 years. So did you learn new things when you started doing research on your own community? When I started doing research in my own community, I learned that I have only one of those properties. I don't eat healthy. But since I got involved into this program, I think healthy, I buy more fresh vegetables, I try to tell people in the, in the community, one of my neighbors, if I get enough of something, I pass it on to her so, so that she can see it. So I'm going to interview her when I get back home and see how she's scratching it. I see people go to the neighborhood uh, supermarket, but they come back with bags, and I'm looking at the bag, I don't see any greens hanging out. <laughs> All I see is canned goods and prepackaged stuff. Right. So we're going to try, I'm gonna, when I interview her, I'm going to try to get her to look at, when she goes shopping, look more for fresh vegetables and how to put it on, you know, teach her children how to do that. You good?
wove them into the knee team, into our bigger team, and out of that came Sankofa University, which we're going to be talking about today. Sure. Jeremy. Okay. So, when you think of community, um, one of the big things I want is breaking it down to understand it right now. Because sometimes community can be difficult to understand. So, when we think about community, I like to deal with the root word. And what is the root word of community? Human, right? But what is unity? Some people say unity is, oh, we share the same values, right? We share the same interests, the same goals. But how does that transpire to community working with community? It's a little bit different. So when you talk about community working with community, it's a co-constructing model, right? So you already heard about co-authoring, right? You heard about- well, That's coming next. Oh, I'm sorry. First. Right? So when you talk about the collaborative efforts and the word co, right? Um, co-implementing is probably the most important part, right? Because that's, to me, where the transformation happens, where both of us are transformed from the work that we're doing, whether it's through the senses, right? Whether it's through brainstorming. Whether it's still learn how to eat better, right? By being in this program that we're offering through the community, right? Those are transformative things that are happening to individuals who are actually going to do what? Pass that down. So now you're talking about legacy, right? So, with that being said, um, our actual work with actual co implementing involves a co constructive framework, like I talked about, that engages in CBPR that talks about researching with, right? Instead of what? Yeah, exactly, right? So they're a part of the process. And when I say they're part of the process, that's when everything from brainstorming to actually trial and error, right? And bring it back to the table to figure out, okay, what did we say what worked part of our framework and what didn't work in our framework? So um, it also involves shared leadership. Everybody can lead, right? Depending on your expertise, you lead on that. So if you don't know about that loud, fall back. I got that. <laughs> Right? You focus on the rhetoric of research, rise on, rise on, right? Yeah. And then we fall back, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a give and take process, but at the same time, we're sharing leadership, right? Share transformation, right? Not only are you a bar your environment about transforming, we're also transforming too, right? And also looking at shared evidence. Who owns the data? Mm -hmm. That's what it comes down to. Let's be, let's be real, let's be quite frank with each right? There's money in this, right? And a lot of the money that is trickled down from who owns the data. Well, nobody owns the data in our university partnership. We share the data on the evidence. And last but not least, being able to come up with shared solutions, right? There's no one right way to deal with community issues, right? If Brother Robert has a different way of how I should deal with a few kids in my program who are claiming gains, then I'm gonna hear what he's saying because obviously he may bring something to the table that I was not thinking. Right? Yeah. So that's very, very critical to be able to understand that we have to have a shared solution mix. Right? Because with every problem, it's always been a freedom school model. Um, don't bring more problems without having a solution. So with, without further ado, um, I would like to move on to co offering. But that's for it. Thank you. things that was very important to us was that we wrote, we authored together. It's going to be a challenge. We're going to let you know right now. <laughs> it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. So come into this with your eyes open. And we also were committed to the, the anything we produced was accessible to the community. So that it wasn't just some academic article in a review journal that nobody read. And uh, we ended up with a book that they'll talk about in a bit. And writing it was, you know, my whole world was about analyzing data and writing. And so I had a process, and Joyce had a process, and it wasn't the same process with me ago. You know, and there were certain frustrations. And I remember a day where I was like, look, I'm not seeing any writing. We had to share a Google Doc, and I was like, I, they would print it out and then they would read it and then and so George one day says interrupts me and says who who here has ever read a, written a book I'm like <laughs> right and that let me know okay we have to stop and rethink this so, so no one else book. in that group had written a book so the expectation of here are the deadlines we have to keep with the publishers uh, here's what writing has to get done. Okay, you're saying it. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking. 
Because in the community, we like to talk. We actually talk through it. So she was getting frustrated, mad at us. And we said, well, who's written the book? One person raised their hand. So why are you mad at us? <laughs> Let's go back to this process and explain it. And in that explanation, we found out about, so at the university level, there's this thing called a single? Single author. Single author. We like, so what does that mean? Oh, OK, so it means only you can be on it. Or some people, based off of where you are in the university in your career, you can do, depending on who you're working with, what you can actually do. Oh, OK. So now we have to work, as they was said earlier about Jeremy, now we're learning. So co-authoring, because one thing that we would get offended with in the, the neighborhood is we would hear them cite, uh, what's called? Paul Gary. I'm Paul Gary, but no, like. <laughs> <laughs> I love Paul Gary. My grandmother, my grandfather, my, their grandmother and grandfather, that information already is just different right now. Right. So they would cite people we didn't know. We're like, I don't know who this person is, but Sam was just like, my grandma said the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother, or well, the guy down the street said that. And with you, a lot of things that you're bringing to the table, yes, it comes from the academic area. But as you're sharing part of yourself, you're actually sharing part of yourself in your culture. And what we're doing as community members, we're bringing those things out. But side, let's give them credit. What's happening is we're bringing it out. And the co-author, they're starting to see their name. You're starting to value. <laughs> starting to value them. You're starting to remember. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. We've actually done this before. Mm -hmm. OK. And then we go on the common speed and start to pick up. Now we're in, not just talking about it. We're talking about doing it. We're doing it, as he said. We're co-implementing. OK, yeah, you, have, you said you're going to do this part. OK, you got that part. <laughs> if you need it, we're right here. Mm -hmm. Now we're doing it. And also working with the public. So we settle on this situation where we would meet every week and we would write all over a whiteboard and uh, or sometimes uh, for the history of Rochester chapter in a second that we said we'll talk about I just they just narrated the story and I just had to go crazy and um, also negotiating with publishers they did not want to put everybody's name as an author um, so we settled on an edited book and each chapter is authored by eight, ten people. Um, covers different parts, but the reality was we all wrote the book together. But so the edited thing in chapters was an artifact of the publisher's demands. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Miss Addy now, who will talk a little bit about that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. As everybody knows, my name is Addy. The book that I'm going to read something from called Community Literary as Shared Resource to Transformation. And my friend Kyle is representing the grandchildren that I'm reading to and talking to. I want them to know my story. And I'm going to page 11 if you ever have the book to read it. And I have made peace with my past about a bad situation in my life. And it's in the book. Part of the American history, part of the African American culture. Mm -hmm. In the 1960s, we had a street dance every weekend. I attended as a celebratory by residents. Police responded to picking people out of random and beating them. On July 24, 1964, at the corner of Ward and Joseph Avenue, the crowd turned on the police who brought dogs to control them. Conversations about police brutality had begun around the same time due to the beating of Rufus Sparrow, a well known local storm, which was a part of my family. And nobody knows but me and my family. This part right in this book here made me have peace. I'm crying not because I'm sad. I'm crying because now I can talk about it and let you know what the reality of it is. To be a part of this history, to know that we are still in plantations. 
no matter how we do it. And I am happy to say that thanks to Freedom School, Community San Kofa, I've been able to be able to talk about it and be peaceful. My family and I have discussed it. We never were able to discuss it. And I hope from this day that the young man we have here representing the grandchildren of our community can know about our history, know that we stand on some strong shelves. Minister, spirit-led, 
and I do outreach ministry in the community, in that community that he was in. He didn't know what I was doing, but I knew what he was doing, and I know because he was doing that, that he was going to reach those people in that community, and that was the that was the thing that needed to be done. Because I was going out in the community talking to these people and asking them questions, and I was saying, who is asking them? Who's with them? And I learned from these little children. These little children say, I know I go to this place and go to that place, and I know what this one does, I know what that one. These children taught me some stuff. I said, wow, who's talking to them? And so when I met, met him, I remembered him, and he encouraged me to do what I do. Then I had to move out of the community, and life happened, so a lot of life happened, and I got back here last year. And when I got back last year, because when I was watching him in the neighborhood, I never saw the fruition of this. I saw the school, but I'd never been in a school until last year. When I went into the school last year, I went into a little shop. He had said, wow, and I was so excited. I remember that, I remember, and it, that's that 10 years. <laughs> but, and he, when I, I was so excited because it was so familiar to me. And when he said, it's been 10 years, I said, what? <laughs> but it was okay because I saw the vision and I saw it, I saw all the things that he said that he was gonna do. And he was gonna get these people together. And here it is, I said, this is my first time in here last year. And I was just so excited. So therefore, I got on board because I wanted to get on board when he first started. But I'm glad that I can now. I have more energy. And so, and also the thing is so good, hey, if, if I can't be spirit led and I can't move with my spirit, you can't, mm -hmm. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's so sad because a lot of times when you're doing things, if people know who you are and what you're doing, they shut down. But if I'm in the community, I'm still a part of that community. And me being in the community, and the other thing Freedom School let me do, I'm proud to say I'm part Indian, I'm part Black, right. and I'm part Polish. Right. <laughs> and it's not far away, it's great, great, great fans. And so when I go to school, I used to tell them what I am, and no you're not. Because my skin is black don't mean I don't have anything else in me. And I'm saying this to say, if you're talking to someone, if you're not hearing who they are, how are you going to help them? If I'm, if I'm proud of who I am, how are you going to tell me I'm just black? And you don't know all of who I am, so you won't respect who I am because I'm what you think I should be. So that's what the school let me do. And the school let me talk, and the school let me vent, and, and it let me, and I want I love education, so they let me know that I have the freedom to educate. They go to school and hold my head up. And I like that, and I like the way they do it. They do it, they say, be who you are and let it happen. Amen. Amen. Remember 
our histories. We also, through our spirit of building better, build community, we had to share values in how we're going to build communities. What were the building blocks that academia brings? What are the building blocks that the community brings? So in building this community, we had to have shared values. We also had to have grounds for practice in research and in teaching. We as a, uh, as a community university, we had to learn the research techniques that the academia and the university had. We couldn't just say, well, my mom said that. We had to learn how to cite this stuff. We had to Justin D. Banks, uh, 1942. We had to decode it, you know, because some of our words were used that, that I could, you know, the university like, what's that mean? You know, we're, we're going to do this. You know, we're going to do what? What's that mean? <laughs> I mean, that means we're about to do this. this <laughs> activity. <laughs> and, and so anyways, like, on all of that, the spirit of shared values, in order for any of this to happen, we had to have faith. Now, your faith may be different from my faith. But we had to have shared faith. And everybody said, well, what was your faith? Your faith, what's the basic foundation of faith? And we said, well, the trust, the belief in something, that something's going to happen. You don't see it now. We didn't see this. We didn't see this then. But we see it. And it's, that's right. It's okay. But it took our shared values. It took a trust. It took us being able to believe in one another that we weren't going to hurt one another that we were going to grow this thing from the university to the university, from the hood to the classroom to the, to the boardroom. But we had to believe. And that belief that we had, we had in each other first. That's right. That's right. right. And then we believed in our methodologies that we were using. They didn't say to us, oh, the way we when y'all came up with that, that don't make sense. And we were saying, well, what you're saying don't make sense to us because all those words is mumble jump. We don't understand. But we were able to come together and believe and trust in one another because there was no hurt, harm, or danger going to happen. The spirit of truth and justice reigned, and we were able to have these shared values and continue to build because we're here today. Some of us have never traveled together, and some of us have traveled outside of the country together. We had to trust one another. We had to share values. We had to build upon our own experiences. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to think this life is on free, it's on free. If you think you're going to walk into a community and you're going to bring them a value system, <laughs> you lost your mind. <laughs> you lost your mind. Just call us up one eight hundred. Don't answer that question. Give the truth. Get your butt out of that community. Right. We have to be brought in. Have those shared values. Understand those shared values what you have and believe that this can be done. That's right. That's right.
think for myself is trust and that allowing us to tell our stories mm -hmm. without you trying to pervert our story mm -hmm. or change our story mm -hmm. to, for the comfortability of some. Mm -hmm. I'll say it like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I'm, I'm amazed that I'm here, and I'm from Ithaca, New York. We have all the major, we have all the major colleges in our area. Mm. However, when we work with them, and I try to work closely because they always say they want to do this engagement yes. with <laughs> communities, right? Yes. But what happens is they're not talking about our communities; they're talking global. Um, but I've been working with a professor who's in SUNY Cortland who we did a presentation here. However, um, we didn't get this agreement at first. So what we've decided to continue to do our work together because we know it's not. So I heard a lot today that I can take back to my community. But, I, but the challenge for me is this, right? And y'all talked a little bit about it. The finances, the money pieces, do not come to the community. Like, I don't have no degree in nothing. I have a, I have a bachelor's, no, I have a master's in um, streetology. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's about 
how much you let the university profit off of your work mm. by making them mm. engage. Right. So you have to decide that. Oh, yeah, here, I want, here, here. So Sankofa <coughs> University, this is, this is new. We just started this um, in the fall. But this, this to us is a kind of a model of saying that the university has always been the hub, the research has gone around, and there's a lot of challenges. Maybe you must know. We're moving, we're, we want to move that hub, mm. actually. We want to move that hub into the community. Mm -hmm. Our goal for Sankofa University is to say we are a university within the, within the community. Our offices are right here in the community. We got this, we have a small part of our team here. We've got a nice big team. By the time our next end goal team graduates, we have 21, no, we'll have 30 certified community researchers who are can be co-investigators, co co-PIs. They're out there doing the consenting. They're, they're truly researchers. The, the questions are coming from them. So we want to be that hub. Whether the University of Rochester or other universities in the in our broader community, wanting to research within an urban community, you want to come talk to us, we'll pair you with wonderful researchers. Mm -hmm. So trying to work within the university structure, we can do some of that. But we want to we want to try to do things. So come, if it is not that far away, come on up. No, no, yeah, yeah no. come north. I'm trying to get Rochester to, to, to be one of our partners. Because I work for Alliance and Parents for Justice. And we have a, a partner in Buffalo. But, and we work with people returning, uh, mass incarceration, people mm -hmm. incarcerated. So anyway, I'll give y'all that information. It sounds so like a new hub on our news. Yeah. 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 yeah, oh, yeah, definitely come on up. And th we're gonna, we'll come back next year and tell you how it's going. Because this is a new model that we're kind of working, and I think it has some potential. Yes, quick comment. The lady from New Jersey, give me your information, because someone from New Jersey asked me from a university to talk about this program, so let me know so I can let you know who it was. Absolutely, okay. we're right in the capital of New Jersey, trying okay. to do the same thing, that's right. Yes. So I'll be right up there. <laughs> <laughs> One of the challenges that I have in working alongside um, communities, even my own community, for liberation is our varying definitions of what liberation for black children should look like. Yes. And, um, and also, us not, even when we do this work, not um, continually to interrogate our practices to make sure that it is truly liberatory. Mm -hmm. And it and um, for for youth and however they show up, however however they show up, you know, and whoever they are. And um, and so that's really hard because like I'm from Buffalo, New York. I was born and raised in Buffalo, New York. I don't know, and I grew up in church, so i people know me now, but yeah. something so I respect I respect my elders, I respect the young people, but I do think sometimes it's hard when um, when we're not, like, um, when I, I wonder, like, we, we just really have to decolonize our minds mm -hmm. and really think about, you know, uh, liberation for, for our communities and how can I do that in a way where I'm honoring, you know, I'm honoring my, my elders and I'm listening to what um, their stories and why they had to do certain things and why they um, did things in a certain way, but also making it a, a true liber a lib liberatory space or for my students that are coming up and they're coming up and they're telling me sharing certain things with me. So that's where mm -hmm. that's what I'm thinking. The kind of model that we develop at Freedom School to kind of help with that process and how you start that up mm -hmm. is what you see right here. This is something I forgot to touch. So this is going to launch JSL to become junior servant leaders. This process, or the title of a junior servant leader, actually originated out of the Philadelphia St. Cofa Freedom School, or no, Kevin White. All right, so I chose the first one Freedom School. So we think Freedom School, you talk about Freedom School on a large scale. We're just one of the Freedom Schools in like 29 states, right? So the JSL, the intergenerational mentorship model we choose to use is basically holding the youth responsible to teach the younger people. Right? Okay. So we create this wealth of knowledge among each other. Whether it's knowing how to navigate the social systems, whether it's understanding how to deal with long-term pursuit of goals, whether it's dealing with leadership development, whatever it is, you make sure that we hold the youth accountable to teach the babies. And guess what? Eventually, this baby will teach younger people. Right. Karen Tubman said, I would have freed more people 
if they realize oh, they were in Spain. Yeah. So there, there must be a process to address it. And as you said, create a space where you're comfortable talking about it. Because if you don't even talk about it, you'll never get to a definition of different levels of freedom. Yeah. And just for a clarification, we're actually not used to just, when you see somebody stop talking, take a breath, go. <laughs> because we'll forget this army is in When somebody stops talking, take a breath, go. <laughs> so the other thing with that is not only creating that space, but also when you're, when you're breaking that down, you also, before you move forward in a breakdown process, you got to build it back up. So a healing process has to be uh, taken into consideration before your next level of move based on how uh, deeply ingrained the condition is for certain communities, right? And so the, that has to be understood. The other thing that has to be understood, which goes back to what uh, Brother Moses was saying, is that if you don't have the resources, your people must understand themselves as assets. Yeah. So here you have it. The most precious asset is a person. Per people, you have both, though. You have assets and you have liabilities. Any individual who is taken from the community is a liability, right? Anyone who is uh, putting poison around the idea of liberation is a liability. Anyone who is pushing toward that freedom and all that is to be done is an asset because their passion is, going, is what is going to fuel and help move in that spirit of bringing more and building more and building on the stories of those elders, right? And so in, in our communities, we have respect for our elders, uh, and then it's a bridge that somebody got lost somewhere, right? And so a lot of people, a lot of individuals speak on uh, the, the economic gaps, right? The, all of these gaps, the biggest gap in our community is a communication gap, right? And the communication gap is that we stop passing down the story. Right. And because I stop hearing my elder, I don't know where I'm going. But it has to, back to this process, these babies are taught the respect for a story that came before them. And with the respect of a story that came before them, they understand the importance of their story being passed down. So they understand themselves as an asset. And so if they're missing, if they're missing, just think about it as a bridge. If a bridge is missing and I need to get from here to there, how can I? That means I have to start all over again. In mind, body, emotion, and in spirit. You know what I'm, you know, if, if that makes sense. That makes sense? That makes sense. sense. If that makes sense, let me say it makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So understand that you are your greatest asset. And so yeah. what begins to happen? So I know me as a poet, as an author, what can I do? I have no money in my pocket. I can go on a corner right now with a bucket and start poetically speaking. And money will come, right? Be it 50 cent or 50 dollars because of my skill set, right? I am an asset to my community. That 50 cent I will put in the bigger bucket that is in line with where we're going. Does that make sense? That makes but sense. the kid who does not know how to utilize that gift or utilize themselves as assets will wait for somebody to present jobs to them in order for them to move. So you gotta be under, be, begin to understand there's another flavor and then I'm gonna shoot it to my sister in the back. But that one piece that we begin out of the research that from these things that I spent off after the research was developing a piece entitled The Zero Factor, right? And so what is the zero factor when dealing with the young people? It is this simply. You can have a plot of land or a, a plot of land and it has a mansion, a big beautiful house. Does it make sense so far? Okay, I talk fast, so I just want to make sure we're saying it. And it can have a beautiful house, a four-car garage, make sense? Bless. And the plot of land right next to it. Same same amount of land. You bring young people to both plots of land, and you ask, what do you want? What we realize is that the young people, eight times out of 10, are going to go with the mansion. They can go with what they see. Because in seeing, there's less work that has to be done. Not knowing that with the three-story mansion or the next plot of land can build a 20-floor unit that will bring in more income than that mansion. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
But they're not going for it because they're not taught to see what is not there. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, go quick. Count to five. One, two, three, four. What happens to zero? So like I said, right, the zero factor is you have to see what is not there. We are taught that zero does not exist. That's false. Zero exists as something. So zero is also known as nothing. So we have to just keep that in mind, and that's one of the things that we do with the young people when they come into our space. How you doing, beloved? Um, if you ever heard him do poetry, you need to have him do, if not do Black Child, who Black Child? One of my favorites. Um, so to answer part of the question, um, and I think it's really important to tie it to the plenary this morning, mm. yes. had to deal with education. And, and I say education because she talks about, she talked about invisibility versus disappearing. Mm -hmm. And I think as a community, we're becoming disappeared. And, and the only way to actually make us not invisible is through education. Um, and so when, when I think about that, and I think about this word Sankofa, and at my school, Sankofa simply means to go back and retrieve what you have forgotten. Yeah. When you talk about that in terms of the stories, you have to talk about it in terms of education. So my sister over here from New Jersey, who's doing her dissertation, my dissertation is talking about returning the black teacher to the black classroom. Right. That's what it is. That's next month. All right. Um, <laughs> and so if, in, in order for us to return this community, we have to actually start by educating this community. Right. And we have to start with our children because I mean no disrespect. We can talk about economics all day long, but if our babies don't understand what they lost and where they're going, we can't build that, that community yes, anywhere. Yes. I hate to say it, at some point I'm going to be gone, but my babies are going to know where they came from, and the only way I can do that is through educating them. And so if we really want to start and build this community from within, we have to start in the classroom. We have to educate these babies and we have to educate our parents because our parents did not get the stories from the grandparents, and so they don't know that there's actually a step missing in that ladder that they need to climb, and they might actually need to hold each other up and push them to the next level. If not, they're going to fall through that slot, and then they're going to disappear. And that is not part of the history that we can tell anymore in this country. Thank you very much, everybody.